Boa tarde, amigos. Agora vamos... Do you want to take some pictures? Yes, I can take, but I have to coordinate the beginning of the session. É... Então, amigos, vamos começar agora a sessão, nossa sessão da tarde. É... E aí chama a presença aqui para nossa querida, para nossa mesa, é a presença do Saulo Araújo e do professor David Robinson. É, parte do pessoal ainda está chegando de Birité, então nós vamos já começar, eles já nos deram autorização, porque estarão aqui em cinco minutos, e aí eu vou já chamar aqui o professor Saulo, sempre né, no ponto, pronto para ação, já está aqui, ele foi chamado e gentilmente veio estar aqui conosco, não só para fazer o comentário da fala do professor David Robinson, mas também é, ele está aqui presente para fazer o lançamento do seu livro, é, o primeiro da coleção Clássicos da História da Psicologia. No final, quando tiver, esperamos um público maior, a gente volta a falar, reforçar o lançamento de livros que a gente vai ter aqui agora no final. Então, Gostaria de chamar também o professor David Robinson, please take your seat. Oh, seat. Seat, or if you want to stay here in front. Here. Then you have a gift of a precious microphone. Okay. And, uh, then, uh, então, eu só queria fazer uma rápida apresentação, que é, uh, David Robinson é um especialista justamente não só em autores do século XIX, início do século XX, mas também da, de psicologia russa, ou ainda nós poderíamos dizer psicologia da Europa Oriental, é presidente da Cairon Society é, e também Truman University. David. Truman. Truman. I was. <risos> He was. He was. Mas, pensando no que ele verdadeiramente isso ou é nesse momento, ele, então, presidente da Cairon e, ao mesmo tempo, né, um especialista nesses temas que inclui o tema da psicofísica do FEC. A gente vai fazer, como na apresentação do Jim, ele fala, mas a gente tem um PowerPoint traduzido aqui para que vocês possam acompanhar. Se, porventura, o inglês falhar, nós temos aqui o PowerPoint para salvar. Então, é, 40 minutos. É, less. Less. We, After, we'll use, we talked about it. I think I'll go less, and he can use a little time. Okay. Then I will, I'll make this uh, terrible work to control the time, but uh, and a desire, very good look for your presentation. And maybe you can go longer. I hope not, but okay. maybe. <laughs> um, it, it is uh, uh, so much fun to be here with my Brazilian friends, but there was a... Uh, a big problem until today is that Salo was not here. Uh, Salo and I are brothers. We are brothers who were raised in Leipzig. And, uh, and it's not a joke, really. We have almost, I'm the older brother, we have almost the, uh, the same kinds of interests and uh, the kinds of education uh, that we had in the home of experimental psychology in the first home of experimental psychology. And so when Salo uh, talked to the professors there, uh, one of them, my good friend, uh, Ana Rose uh, Metka, uh, said to Salo, do you know David Robinson? And he said, no. She said, you will. You have to. So since then, uh, we've enjoyed, we have not enough time to work together, but we always consult one another We, read, we review each other. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a close, it's, a, it's a close family. Uh, we also have close family here in Brazil. You know, one of the founders of Chiron uh, was named Joseph Brochek. And he was an advisor to Marina Massimi, who founded your society. When Joseph Brochek first came to Brazil, Uh, he would not give a lecture, uh, he said, until he learned Portuguese. And so the next time he came back, 
He gave his lecture in Portuguese. Well, I tried. I started learning Portuguese, but I must speak in English today. I'm, I am not Joseph Brocek. The main topic for several of our lectures is what do the classics propose for the 21st century? Um, for Fechner and psychophysics, uh, this might be a difficult challenge to answer that question, uh, but I've chosen to talk about a particular, uh, a particular side of Fechner, uh, about his motivations and his plans for psychophysics as a great program for science, for philosophy, for all of knowledge, really, a way to understand the world. Usually historians do not, and I am a historian, not a psychologist, historians do not like to propose for the future. We concentrate on better understanding of the past. Uh, Emanuela Colombo discussed this interesting aspect yesterday uh, in his uh, talk that Marina read to you. But uh, I want to try to at least compare uh, Fechner's context, the context of his work, and his motivations, maybe to your own. And I'm very happy to see young people here just beginning their work. Uh, you will build the future of psychology. And so um, I think um, it's important to look at a founding uh, thinker like Fechner and see what his plans were for the future of psychology, even though we go back to 1860 or so to do this. Uh, this talk will not really talk much about psychophysics as you learned it, and I'm sure you did learn it when you started uh, studying uh, psychology. And uh, as I've uh, mentioned before, I hope not to talk too long, we can uh, Salo will be in charge of discussion and questions, uh, but I also want to hear about his project because it's connected to these classics. So, I um, begin with the young Fechner. And this is a, a portrait of Fechner, probably when uh, he was about the age of some of the younger people here, and it was painted by his brother. Uh, he had a typical uh, lower middle class, educated German um, uh, upbringing. His father was a pastor, but his father died and left his mother and several children uh, with, uh, in a very bad shape. So uh, it's interesting that uh, she and an uncle uh, did a very good thing to get them good education, and they were all very industri industrious, as you can see. Uh, this is a good painter uh, for the Romantic period in Germany of the young Fechter, Fechner with dreamy eyes, and his older brother uh, was able to capture uh, this essence. It's a rather rare photograph you hardly ever see of Fechner we were able to find. Uh, I will talk about these five things. His education, from medicine to physics, to the laboratory physics, and then uh, a great crisis in his life, and something that we always call the garden experience. Um, a lot of psychologists, if you look at the biography of Wundt or James, probably Watson for all I know, uh, will mention a, a difficult experience that they had that somehow changed their life. And Fechner certainly had this one. In fact, I almost have a theory that because Fechner had such a famous one, every, every other psychologist had to write one in their autobiography too. <laughs> he may have invented this, but he really had it. And out of this experience and the recovery from this experience comes uh, his definition of psychophysics. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit about his famous book, number four, The Elements of Sci Elementa de Psychophysik, Elements of Psychophysics. And, uh, but then I'm going to talk about it a different part than the part you usually learn about. 
and then how he defended and explained his ideas uh, in two interesting ways, psychological aesthetics and measuring collectives, or the theory of collectives. And this um, is connected with the big project of Fechner and how psychophysics makes it all work together. Uh, as I said, he was left um, um, without the support of a father, but he had good family support for an education in Leipzig. He went to Leipzig and he never left. He became a part of the university rather quickly, first as a student of medicine, but the, then because of this man on the left, who's quite old in this picture, but was young then, his name was E.H. Ernst Heinrich Weber, uh, he became interested in laboratory science because Ernst Heinrich Weber was one of the teachers of anatomy to the medical students who made them do work in laboratory and understand experimental methods. It was rather new then to do this with medical students. And, and E.H. Weber was a pioneer, a very important leader in this movement. He wasn't the only one, but he was very important. So he inspired Fechner. Weber actually had two other brothers who were also scientists, another physiologist like Weber, and then the younger brother with the uh, strange eyeglasses. Uh, it might not surprise you that he was a famous German physicist, physics, um, that, uh, Wilhelm Weber. Uh, Fechner came to know Wilhelm through his teacher, Ernst Heinrich, and he never finished the exams for medicine. Instead, he began to write books, to translate experimental science, especially physics and chemistry, and the experimental science that he translated came mostly from France. They were the best uh, in those days, and the Germans were wanting to learn the mathematical methods of the French on treating data from laboratory experiments, particularly in physics, to some extent also in chemistry. And so Fechner, instead of making a living by a, uh, being a physician, uh, I guess Germany was full of physicians, he decided to be a writer of books, a translator of books in science. When he translated, though, he always added chapters of new material, and then he started adding his own experiments in physics. So he had this, um, this ambition. He also wrote because he loved writing, uh, and he had some interesting ideas that I think you will, uh, I'm going to try to explain some of the more interesting ones today. Uh, he started writing books under the name of Dr. Mises about how the bodies of angels can be described, or uh, what are the bad practices in medicine where they try to solve every problem by giving people iodine, either internally or externally. They were funny books. They sold very well, and they made him famous because everyone knew that this young man was Dr. Mises. But it was those translations of the French physics that changed his life because while he was there and getting to know everyone who was doing science in Leipzig. Leipzig was a growing university, quite important, even in Germany, quite important. Um, the professor of physics suddenly died. Uh, this happened a lot in the 19th century. <laughs> People died. And they decided that the best person to continue the laboratory was this young man, Fechner, even though he didn't exactly have the background. He had taught himself a lot of mathematics, although he always uh, said that he didn't know enough mathematics. Well, compared to the Weber brothers, probably he didn't know enough, but uh, he managed to uh, do okay in the laboratory. He worked very hard and published a lot on uh, electricity. In these days, in the 1830s and 1840s, the ideas of electricity and magnetism were just being put together by people like Faraday and Ohm and others 
who saw that there were connections between electricity and magnetism. And as you know, magnetism can generate electricity. They're discovering these things and trying to work out uh, experiments to understand how to describe this mathematically. And I think some of you who had physics classes know how to do this. Uh, this work began uh, with uh, Wilhelm Weber and Gauss in Göttingen. Uh, and they used, uh, they developed actually a theory uh, that held for a long time until a certain Englishman uh, named Maxwell came along and did everything. But, uh, but uh, you have to say that Fechner and some of his publications contributed to the elements of this German theory of electromagnetic um, science. So he became professor of physics in his own right, right about the time that he lost his eyesight. He lost his eyesight um, because he was doing his own experiments on light and electricity, and he was looking at after images in um, uh, some observations uh, that involve sunlight. And basically, he looked at the sun too much. And he lost his eyesight, he became ill physically, and definitely depressed and ill mentally. We would say these days that he was put on disability, given a couple years that he didn't have to work, that he could recover, but it went very badly. Then, uh, the garden experience. Now, we don't have the garden where this happened, but this is a, the botanical garden of the university in Leipzig, and it probably shows a little earlier in the season than when it happened for Fechner, uh, because it happened in October for Fechner. This looks like a June garden in Leipzig here. Um, he went outside, and all of a sudden, he could see. Just suddenly, his sight returned. He'd been having a lot of consultations with doctors, and so uh, it's not surprising that uh, with rest that this happened. But when he could see, he said that he saw things he'd never seen before and understood things he'd never understood before. It was even as if the flowers themselves were talking to him. And uh, he later wrote about this idea when he wrote a book called The Soul Life of Plants. The idea that everything has life, including the things like planets and stars and um, molecules and atoms that we consider not to have life. Fechner believed in panpsychism, and this insight came to him. And it's not the kind of insight you ex expect out of a mathematical physicist, maybe, but it did. And he described it later, this experience, on that particular day. He said, I believed that God himself had called me to do extraordinary things and that my suffering had prepared me for it. And I felt that I in part possessed extraordinary psychic and physical powers, that the whole world now appeared to me in another, man, in another light. The riddles of the world, that's a great German word, Weltretzel. The riddles of the world seemed to reveal themselves. My earlier life had been distinguished, and now the present crisis, it seemed to be a new birth. Obviously, my state was close to that of mental disorder. <laughs> he, he admits it. Nevertheless, Gradually, everything settled into symmetry. And this word symmetry, an analogy, I'll add, is very important because everything Fechner takes to his understanding of psychophysics comes out of the symmetries of physics that he learned so well in the work he'd done and analogical thinking about mathematical systems with things like electricity that you can't even see, and so you have fluids and you have motion and that sort of thing. Analogies became important in uh, his understanding of psychophysics as well. So to the third part now, it takes seven years. You know, I used to think that the garden experience was where Fechner realized the 
the fundamental formula of psychophysics. I think we all shortened the, but it took seven years. And he woke, was in bed, as we often are in the morning. Maybe we didn't get to sleep or didn't sleep well. And in the morning, you're just lying there thinking. And all of a sudden, the thought came to him. He wrote it down in his diary. He said, you know, I've been thinking about getting stimulus or data through the senses and how we perceive it or how our sensations are formed. And I think it's just like kinetic energy, that there's a buildup and an addition of things. And then eventually there is enough kinetic energy to move the planet or do whatever has to be done. And then that's the way sensation happens, is through the buildup of this kind of psychic energy. And so he takes one of the results from his friend A.H. Weber, the famous um, rel relativity, you'd say, of sensation. It's just the idea, this uh, equation, delta R over R equals a constant, Weber's constant. It just means that when we can judge things, we judge them according uh, not to their absolute value, but to their relative value. One famous experience is a weight. Give a person two weights, they're exactly the same. Give them a weight that is a little different, it still feels exactly the same. But then you reach the point where the weight is about three, maybe five percent different. And then the person says, ah, this one is heavier, right? Because it's, and it doesn't matter whether the weight is 10 pounds or the weight, or two kilos, or the weight is just a few, um, um, or half a kilo or something like that. The, the, the level doesn't matter, it's the relative thing. So Weber did that, he found that it was quite true in many different sensory systems. The, the number, the constant would be different. For light, it's a much smaller amount, less than half a percent difference you would detect. But it's always that relationship. So Weber said that, and Fechner being a physicist said, it's like kinetic energy. And if this were kinetic energy physics problem, we would just integrate that sucker, knowing mathematics, and saying that the integral of dx over x is the log of x. And that's where you get the logarithmic relation. And you have a different constant before that when you integrate. So he defines sensation really according to this. Now there's a lot of things wrong with this, as people will find out later, that you can kind of develop physical and continuous systems for stimulus, but for sensation, that's something different. It's something that people report, right? So to quantify that, you have to come up with a lot of methods, and he did. Uh, three different uh, important methods that physio physiologists and psychologists still use. And he put them, some of them were uh, developed by other people, some of them were developed by Weber and his brother in law, Folkman, another physiologist. But what Fechner did in the next seven years was to put all of these approaches into one book. Um, now, the important things to notice if you are going to believe in the law of Fechner is that the threshold, or the just noticeable difference, the thing that gets you the constant in the first one, becomes the unit of integration. That's a, a mathematical rule. They, if it's, the physicists always work, worry about that, and it works, in, it works in physics for kinetic energy. Another thing is that he assumed, and this is by analogy he assumed from physics, that these units would be stable that something that shows you a just noticeable difference can be the same unit as something that's noticed to be higher later on in the equation. These are assumptions that, of course, other psychophysicists have criticized later. But this didn't bother him because he thought he was discovering something really fundamental about the relationship between stimulus and perception, sensation. He published these ideas and even this equation first in a rather mystical book, 1851, that he named 
after the teachings of Zoroaster, the Eastern mystics, Zendavista. It was very popular in those days with literary people in uh, Germany and France too, I think, probably England too, to take ideas from India. But it seemed to him uh, that uh, some of these mystical ideas had importance, so he used this title, and he gave this insight that he'd had in the garden years earlier, and um, he uh, also argued for panpsychism again, uh, that there are kind of, there's no real difference between matter and spirit. All you have to do is understand how they function in relation to one another to know that they're part of the same system. Uh, that book did not sell very well or make a big, make, make it, you know, people just saw it as being another one of these silly books that thinkers like Fechner would write. But uh, we did get this famous graph here, and I have to talk about a little bit. A single stimulus and a single perception. As I mentioned single here, this is the graph you usually see, but the, most, the simplest case. And what can we tell from this? Well, uh, the most important thing to, to notice in the graph is that before this stimulus reaches one, the just noticeable difference, or the unit, there is no sensation. Actually, in that graph, you can't say no sensation. You have to say what instead? Negative sensation. What the hell is that? And according to the log thing, it's going to be relative. That's the way that Weber relativity works out. Now, the curve depends on the constant. Here, I think the constant is about 1. And it could go you know, steeper, but it's going to be the same kind of curve, uh, just changing the constant. So one of the things you notice is that there's a threshold where sensation will give you some stimulus, noticeable. And then the other thing is that there may be negative sensations. And he equated that with unconscious sensations. At a time when this is a, a notion that was being very much discussed in Germany and elsewhere about whether the unconscious plays a particular role. Uh, I believe Mr. Arojo has written about Wundt's, uh, <laughs> very, written very prominently about Wundt's uh, uh, flirting with this idea and then abandoning this idea later. So everyone was involved with the conscious. Now that could just be an artifact of using this um, formula, and in many ways it was just an artifact. But it's very interesting if you then take the next steps that Fechner took, because he thought there was probably something really important about unconscious and about thresholds. And he went much further. Because he, you know, this is not the way sensory systems are. This is one stimulus and one sensation. In fact, our mental lives, our spiritual lives, are built up of a, a bunch of things all put together. And he knew from physics that the best way to put a bunch of things all together is with what kind of mechanics? Wave mechanics. Waves can use Fourier analysis, you can combine waves, and they can have destructive and constructive interference. And Fechner knew all this, and he said, oh yeah, when you put many sensations together, the best way to think about it is they will build and interrupt each other and give you uh, wave functions. So then he follows the idea further. This was the book that he, dis that he wrote, um, well, about 10 years after he, um, but he collected so much data and did quite a lot of experiments himself too uh, for this book. It's, a, I love the title page because it's just a scientific text. This is how a scientific text looks in German, pure, simple. And when you go and look at the pages, if he's talking about, oh, probabilities that you will find a certain um, result uh, when you do an experiment, 
uh, he gives you all the integrals and all the different ways of thinking about it. And then when you do the experiments with different subjects and to see whether, oh, they're doing uh, testing weights with just one hand and having to tell the difference, or testing weights with two hands and having to tell the difference, then you give these typical uh, tables that psychologists love so much still today. So the book was full of this, especially the first part of the book, which was devoted to what he called outer psychophysics. But really, from the very beginning of the book, he said, psychophysics has two parts, outer psychophysics and inner psychophysics. Now, most, and most of your professors, I'm sure, might have mentioned inner psychophysics, and then they just left it at that, forget about it. It went, became to nothing. Well, I'm gonna talk about that nothing. When he talked about the R and the S, stimulus and sensation, he always said, between them, there are psychophysical processes. And actually, this is an interesting thing that Wundt and James and a lot of people talked about, what happened between stimulus and perception. But Fechner, analog analyzing, uh, making an analogy with physics, wanted to take the main result of the law of psychophysics and say that it's like the laws of energy and um, kinetic motion in physics that if we abstract to the pure case, you know, the, they would say without friction and heat in physics, that you get a pure law and that it's always functioning. So he believed that his uh, law was always found to be an approximation for outer psychophysics, what happens when you give an R and then record an S, but he thought that the function inside involving anything with inner, the pro psychophysical processes, I call it PPP. One of my reviewers doesn't like that idea because I made it up. <laughs> psychophysical processes. Uh, maybe I'll try the, ink, the German style and come up with something else. When you use, involve that at all, Fechner believed that his law was exact. Now he doesn't, he, he can't, and he'll admit that he can't prove it, but I think, again, this is the analogy with, uh, you know, frictionless systems, ideal experiments that, uh, the, uh, that the physicists have to use. And so, uh, the last 14 chapters of Elements of Psychophysics are some discussions of how inner psychophysics would work, and that's where he proposes these wave analogies, you know, to use wave mechanics, to put together lots of stimuli. How could they come together? What could this show you? Well, believe me, he thought it was going to show you a lot. I'll show you a couple things. And there's uh, Fechner, a little bit, probably right before he had his blindness, you know, still fairly young. And here is his thinking about waves that he learned from the Weber brothers. In fact, they're credited with what's called uh, wave theory of light and of heat and other things. The Weber brothers uh, were famous for that, so he, he got it firsthand. They have different phases, they have different energies, they can interact. He loved this idea. And this is what he said happens when you put together a whole bunch of old stimuli and new stimuli and they build waves. I want to just show you the, the uh, image, talk about it, get it strong in your mind, and then I'm going to read what he said about it and I hope that it blows your mind. It's taking you to a different place. Um, these are waves and thresholds. The thresholds are the horizontal lines. So anything, if this wave were to come down, then maybe this being, this thinking being, would not know it's a thinking being. It might be something that doesn't have that consciousness. Not because there isn't that consciousness, it is. It just hasn't reached the threshold yet. And if it goes above AB, it can be a thinking being, but it may not realize everything that it could realize. <laughs> For that, it has to have extra energy, 
to hit the A or the C or something to go above the, the next threshold. And so then it can have consciousness of, I don't know, of the laws of physics or consciousness of maybe God, uh, etc. If it doesn't go above, it's down below, it won't have that consciousness. How does it get into that consciousness? By getting more stimulus, more information that shoots the wave up. But it might also get something that shoots it down. That person might die, right? Does the person's uh, spirit disappear when he dies? No, it just goes below the threshold. Interesting, huh? So keep that in mind and let's read how Fechner says it. Imagine that all the psychophysical processes of a human being are like a wave and that the quantity of these processes is described by the height of the wave above a horizontal baseline or a plane surface to which each psychophysically active point contributes an ordinate. The entire structure and the entire oper operation of the conscious processes depend on the actual and subsequent developing form, the rising and the falling of this wave, whereas the intensity of conscious might at each moment depends on its respective height. The height of this wave somewhere and somehow must exceed a certain limit, which we call the threshold before consciousness or waking can occur. Yeah, and he does explore some, in these chapters, some ideas of dreams and waking and perceptions of reality. One consequence of thinking of waves this way, and maybe I should, after reading that, I should show you that again, okay? Uh, you could be alive but not awake, but then be up higher in the next one and be awake, or maybe... You're, it's the afternoon or the perfect professor is boring and he gives you destructive energy and you fall below consciousness. I mean, all these things he maps in his mind. But he thinks, remember that I said to you, what happens if the person dies? They don't disappear. Their, ener their mental energy just sinks below a, one of the important uh, thresholds. But not everything is below that threshold. The consequence of this conception leads to the view of an omnipresent conscious God in nature in whom all spirits move, live, and have their being, as he also lives in them. The heavenly bodies and the individual spiritual intermediate beings between, dwell in between him and us. And these creature spirits carry our sensory experiences just as undivided and united in themselves. As for their part, they are carried in the divine God. Like us, these creature spirits carry their own sensory circles that carry within them their own special perceptions. According to the principles of analogy and interconnections that this apparent stepwise construction already furnishes in man himself, we can... We can study it in ourselves, this view can be further developed and supported into this universal um, notion. So, in this connection, we see many reasons to consider the prospect for our own future existence after death. In particular, the following point of view is suggested. If an image in our eyes connected with overwaves after its extinction leaves a memory after effect, that enters into a more universal and higher realm of the memories and thoughts of the common or principal consciousness, then we ought to believe that something corresponding to this also happens to our principal waves insofar as they, for their part, are over waves with a, above a deeper threshold, and that our souls accordingly enter into a higher spiritual realm in God after death. Well, a lot of scientists didn't really want to follow him there. Um, <laughs> he gained a reputation as being kind of a crazy old man who kept telling the scientists that, because uh, he's already 60 and, you know, had, he'd been retired. He, he couldn't teach. He occasionally gave lectures, mostly about this stuff, sometimes about other things. 
But he was a beloved person and respected for some of the things that he'd done, certainly respected for the first half of psychophysics, which was controversial, as I told you, but still worth working on. People found the system worth criticizing, attacking, developing, etc., and they still do today. But Fechner really wanted the big thing. You know, the program for inner psychophysics, he thought someday we would discover these things about the mind and about, he was interested in um, uh, seances and people communicating with the spiritual world, as was the professor of astrophysics, who imagined that there was a fourth dimension where these spirits could operate if you could only connect to it. So these kinds of things were going on in Leipzig. And Fechner, um, instead of getting angry, he was a very sweet fellow, people loved him, uh, he said, I'll just try other things. Inner psychophysics can help us understand that it's worth doing experiments to see how people receive stimulus in areas that hadn't been treated that way before. Experimental aesthetics. What, you know, the beautiful is something you discover philosophically from first principles or something like that. But he said, no, everything can be done by experiment, by taking readings, and he always kept lots of tables and logarithm tables and did, you know, always trying to find uh, what you would call correlations in data that he was doing. So for experimental aesthetics and for something that he called uh, the theory of collectives or measuring collectives. Uh, this one, experimental aesthetics, was marginally uh, successful or interesting to people, but other people took his idea and did it much better than Fechner did. For the theory of uh, collectives, uh, Michael Heidelberger in Germany has argued that Many important people, Mach and others, took Fechner's broad ideas on new statistical interpretations. Well, what is a collective? Well, is a person a unique thing, or is a person our idea of a collective? It's really our idea of a collective. You know, there are lots of persons out there, and we talk about the person, we're talking about a uh, collective. It's but that's just speaking of people. Um, you could speak, since it doesn't matter whether it's animate or inanimate, you could look at other things. But most of the things that he published about in his theory of collectives were data sets that involve, well, people or sometimes physics. For example, he took data sets that were, you know, the Germans love to collect data and other Europeans data on students and military recruits. Kind of a Galton project, right? So he'd take this all and he would try to develop you know, statistical ways of looking at what you could see about variances. And he actually crit critiqued the Gaussian curve. He wanted to have the, it's complicated, but he wanted to have uh, broader implications. Some people think that the originators of your statistical methods, people like Carl Pilsen, Pearson, and certainly Mach, we know that Mach did, uh, looked at Fechner's ideas when they developed their own. The meteorological data at Geneva, a place with good observatories where you'd have everything measured in weather. Then he took 22 museum catalogs and developed data on the dimensions of over 10,000 paintings hanging in galleries. And there he went back to the aesthetics, you know, this data will tell us something about, you know, experimental or observational aesthetics. And here's something that he did himself. A grain of rye is a collective. Because grains of rye, famously, are bigger and smaller. And when they grow, in the bad weather of Germany, they grow bigger and smaller. So I got together with agricultural people and looked at the collective of a living thing, not a human being. And he describes this in his data and in a big manuscript that was sitting there when he died and not even his wife knew about it. It was actually Wundt and some of his friends who came in to look at Fechner's paper for 
for uh, Wundt's, or for Fechner's wife, and discovered this theory of collectives. So, <sighs> summing up a bit here, um, before I get to his final statement, why would he be so um, uh, enthusiastic and uh, project such an optimistic view of the possibilities of psychophysics as the science for material and immaterial things. Because he grew up in a time and in a place where a lot of this was going on. First, he had these ideas that you could come to these things mystically that came out of Naturphilosophy in early Germany. But he rejected that, really. Those people argued from philosophical um, symmetries. Fechner wanted to argue from hard data. Okay. Everything was coming together. Mathema French mathematical physics, German and French atomic theory. Darwinian revolution. He, he, actually, he actually wrote on all these things. And anytime someone can unify something, it was great. And then sh shortly before he died, Maxwell put together electromagnetic theory in a way that finally surpassed what his friends had done. And that same year, Wundt establishes the institute in the university in Leipzig, where Fechner is a great guy. He said this about the unconscious and the conscious, consciousness and about his formula. He says at the end of the elements of psychophysics. He says, we will research the laws of psychophysics on human. And then we will be able to apply them to the universe. Consciousness and unconsciousness merely display two cases of the same formula. My formula. He called it Weber's formula, but we call it Fechner's formula which at the same time defines their relationship of the transformation of one to the other. So you know what, why something becomes, according to the formula, conscious or unconscious. I cannot prove it yet, but I believe that the progressive development of psychophysical research itself will ultimately lead to this goal of connecting consciousness and unconsciousness. And so I bring to a close my first attempt to achieve this distant in. Well, may you be so successful in your uh, proposals of great theories as Fechner was of his. <laughs> Thank you. Here are the titles of his books and uh, uh, just a few sources and, uh, that I have done and mentioned my Heidelberger, Fechner's nephew, Kunze, and a couple things. Well, I'm, this actually comes from something I'm trying to publish soon, I hope, in the Oxford Research Encyclopedia. I think it's going to be online, but probably not free, but you can get a hold of me if you want to read about this. And I'll leave Salo with this final picture. He'll like it. Uh, eu vou passar para o português agora. Uh, David, thank you very much. It's nice to have you here again. So I, I wrote my text in English for you, okay? Just for you to have an idea. Um, bom, boa tarde a todos. Eu queria agradecer o convite, a organização do evento. Dado avançada a hora, eu vou direto aqui a minha minha contribuição. Eu fiz um, uma espécie de complemento ao que o David trouxe aqui, aproveitando o lançamento recente do, da nova edição da Estética, do Fechner, que acabou de sair pela Springer, na Alemanha, e a Springer me pediu que fizesse um texto é, comentando o livro e a importância do, 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 do livro para a história da psicologia. Então, eu Eu estou trazendo aqui para vocês um pouco desse texto, o texto é maior do que isso, mas é, o, como complemento ao que o David acabou de, de falar. Então, o título é Resgatando o Fechner do Esquecimento, a relação entre estética, psicofísica e metafísica. É, não há dúvida de que Fechner ocupa 
um lugar de destaque na história da psicologia científica. Junto com Wundt e outros, ele tem sido celebrado em manuais de história da psicologia por todo o mundo como um de seus pais fundadores. A questão, porém, central é se a fama de Fechner faz justiça ao seu trabalho e às suas ideias. Olhando com um pouco mais de cuidado, não é difícil ver que partes essenciais do seu projeto intelectual estão ausentes dessas abordagens tradicionais. Por exemplo, embora o seu nome esteja associado corretamente à psicofísica, o contexto histórico, quando muito, aparece como caricatura. É, é como se a psicofísica tivesse sido criado ex nihilo, do nada. É como se as profundas conexões entre a emergência da psicofísica e o interesse de longa duração de Fechner em problemas metafísicos não existisse ou fosse irrelevante. O fato de que Fechner participou ativamente em círculos filosóficos e não se via como um psicofisicista ou como psicólogo, mas, ao contrário, primeiramente, como, eu cito, um filósofo da natureza, fim de citação, é quase nunca mencionado ou levado a sério. Essa, essa confissão está nos diários do, do Fechner, que foram publicados há uns anos atrás na Alemanha. Então, ele disse, eu sou um filósofo da natureza. Ele não fala, eu sou psicofisicista e nem psicólogo. Tanto é, é que a psicofísica contemporânea permanece completamente isolada e desconectada de suas raízes históricas e filosóficas, como mostra uma recente celebração dos 150 anos de aniversário da psicofísica, editado pelo Solomon, em 2011. Dessa forma, é improvável que os recentes avanços na pesquisa histórica das últimas décadas vá promover qualquer mudança nessa relação, porque os psicofisicistas simplesmente não leem ou não estão interessados em saber sobre a história da psicofísica. Entretanto, tomada em si mesmo, a psicofísica é atualmente apresentada, é, é normalmente apresentada, de uma maneira muito simplista. Por exemplo, a distinção fundamental que o David colocou aqui, estabelecida entre psicofísica externa e psicofísica externa, com todas as suas consequências teóricas e metodológicas, simplesmente desaparece das abordagens tradicionais que a gente encontra na história. Mas, ainda mais importante, mesmo a psicofísica externa torna é, fica restrita às suas formas mais simples. Em outras palavras, a estética experimental de Fechner, que é uma extensão da sua psicofísica externa e uma parte muito importante do seu projeto filosófico, também desaparece das abordagens tradicionais. Em vista dessa é, infelicidade, a nova edição da Estética Experimental de Fechner, baseada na primeira edição de 1876, deve ser louvada. Incluída na série da Springer Textos Clássicos das Ciências e editada com a introdução do professor Christian Alesch, da Universidade de Salzburg, ela poderia contribuir para uma avaliação mais simpática e mais adequada, não só da psicofísica de Fechner, mas também de, da sua visão mais ampla. Para ilustrar a relevância desse trabalho, e dada a impossibilidade de entrar em todos os pontos, eu vou focar aqui nos seus dois aspectos essenciais. Primeiro, como Fechner concebe a estética como disciplina experimental e científica, e como ele a relaciona tanto a psicofísica, de um lado, quanto os seus objetivos filosóficos e metafísicos, de outro lado. Então, em 1871, o Fechner já tinha estabelecido os contornos gerais do seu programa estético, é, concebendo, eu cito, 
como um ramo da psicofísica externa, que deve lidar com a medida das relações entre estímulo e sensação, ou, mais é, genericamente, entre a estimulação corporal externa e as consequências psíquicas internas. Fim de citação. Isto incluiria, sobretudo, a sensação de prazer e desprazer, que, para Fechner, são o assunto central da estética. Cinco anos depois, em 1876, Fechner retoma e desenvolve este programa estético em detalhe. Logo no início do seu clássico, né, Estética, é, Forschule der Ästhetik, Fechner introduz uma importante distinção entre estética a partir de cima e estética a partir de baixo. Estetics from above, estetics from below. Ou entre estética filosófica e estética empírica. De acordo com Fechner, é, na estética filosófica, parte-se de cima, começando das ideias mais gerais e dos conceitos mais gerais, descendo para os particulares. Na estética de baixo, procede-se do particular para o geral. Fim de citação. Fechner quer tornar claro é, que ele quer seguir o primeiro passo, ou seja, a estética do Fechner não é a estética do idealismo alemão, a estética do Fechner é a estética experimental, é a estética de baixo, de baixo para cima. É, que ele não vai seguir o primeiro passo, que é o passo seguido por Kant, Schelling, Hegel e os idealistas alemães. Ao contrário, ele escolhe a abordagem empírica. Não é que a estética filosófica esteja errada ou que seja impossível, por princípio. Não. Ao contrário, é apenas uma questão de prioridade. Nas palavras de Fechner, eu cito, eu incluo a estética a partir de baixo entre as pré-condições mais essenciais para a instauração da estética de cima. Ou seja, para o Fechner, só podia ter uma estética de alto nível depois que você tivesse de baixo nível primeiro. Aqui, baixo nível e alto nível, não no sentido pejorativo. Tá? É só de começando da experiência ou começando da metafísica. Então, retomando a demarcação do seu programa estético, é, Fechner estabelece, é, estabelece uma segunda distinção. Há, um, sens, há um, um sentimento de prazer como algo diferente do prazer, de um lado. E há um sentimento de desprazer como algo diferente do desprazer. O ponto central aqui é que a estética de Fechner se refere, primeiramente, eu cito, aos sentimentos de prazer e desprazer, na medida em que eles estão relacionados a representações e sensações é, provocadas do, é, pelo mundo externo. Fim de citação. Infelizmente... Fechner não nos diz o que ele quer dizer exatamente por prazer e desprazer em si mesmos. Ele só fala de sensação ou sentimento de prazer e desprazer. Ele não explica o que é o prazer e o desprazer desvinculado à sensação de prazer. Ele só fala que são duas coisas diferentes. Então, ele afirma apenas que esse conceito depende essencialmente do conceito de sensação de prazer e sensação de desprazer. Ou então, o máximo que ele chega a distanciar disso é chamando prazer e desprazer de fatores psicológicos, apenas isso. Como consequência, o assunto principal da estética de Fechner é um tipo de sensação ou sentimento associado ao prazer e desprazer, que é desencadeado por objetos externos percebidos. Enquanto tal... A estética de Fechner é psicológica na sua essência, o que significa dizer que a estética é parte da psicologia. Essa é a razão pela qual Fechner diz que, eu cito, as leis da estética estão subordinadas às leis psicológicas. Fim de citação. E ele repete que, eu cito, desde 
que as leis estéticas se referem aos efeitos do mundo externos na nossa mente, elas podem ser vistas como pertencendo à psicofísica externa também. Fim de citação. Nesse sentido, a, a estética experimental de Fechner não apenas está é, intimamente relacionada com a psicofísica e com a psicologia no sentido mais geral, mas também com a estética filosófica e com a metafísica. Entrando nesse caminho indutivo de sair do particular para ir para o geral, é, poderíamos marchar de generalização, a, é, de generalização a outras generalizações até atingir o reino de Deus, entendido como, eu cito, um espírito consciente que governa e conecta todo o universo. Fim de citação. Aqui, diz Fechner, teríamos que pensar nos sentimentos de prazer e desprazer de Deus. Somente, então, após o trabalho de base, o trabalho da estética é, from below termina, só depois que esse trabalho inicial termina, é que a estética from above pode começar. E só nesse sentido que ela seria possível, depois que você tiver uma estética inicial, uma estética básica. Então, nesse, nesse trabalho, o belo da Schöne apareceria evidente em relação com Deus. Fim de citação. E eu termino, então. Não pode haver dúvida, dado o que eu expus acima, de que Fechner via a ciência como um passo intermediário para o mundo invisível, o que revela as suas fortes intenções e inclinações metafísicas, ao contrário do que os psicofisicistas contemporâneos entendem sobre a psicofísica de fé. Muito obrigado. Make uh, one. I think it's unfortunate that we do this together because we cannot disagree <laughs> on this subject. Uh, you just extended using uh, the special case of the Vorschule of their aesthetic, the aesthetics work, many of the same pr points that I was trying to make and that Fechter... That's, that's the reason I saw that my intention was to complement. <laughs> yes, you, you extend it into one area. Um, I do have one um, suggestion. Uh, about pleasure and displeasure. Mm -hmm. And I'll have to think about um, Unlus and Misfall and how that works. But I think you could take his ideas about how the wave packets in inner psychophysics reach a certain um, um, threshold. And there will be a threshold of pleasure. And then you have to decide whether displeasure is another below the threshold or below yet another threshold. So I, I think there could be some expl explanation in his system of that problem. Uh, then we have time for two or three questions. The first will be made by <laughs> our William. Let me take you the microphone. Yeah. I propose myself to make a, a question. I tried to put the, the, the translation in English of Saulo test, but it didn't appear uh, after, for example, for Jim and Helena, I can share with you if you want the Saulo song. Infelizmente, você não sabe o que aconteceu, Arthur. Nós nos perdemos quando voltávamos lá da, ah, é? do Rosário. Nos perdemos completamente. Eu achava que a professora Regina sabia bem o caminho. Ela se empolgou, talvez, conversando comigo sobre os nossos temas do Congresso, e nos perdemos, nos perdemos completamente. <risos> Tanto é que a gente era para chegar desse lado aqui, nós chegamos por esse outro lado aqui. Foi uma virada da cidade assim, e eu perdi grande parte dessa belíssima palestra do professor David. 
Depois eu quero que você me compartilhe. Mas aí eu vou, eu vou provocar o meu querido amigo, que eu já vi o seu livrinho novo, já me inscrevo para comprar um. É muito bom, recomendo a todos. Não saiam daqui sem esse livro. É do... Ah, mas o Saulo, olha... O, o, é, 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 esse, essa sua guinada, na verdade, para o lado axiológico, Hã? o lado axiológico, isso é assim desde Aristóteles. Esse é o grande problema. Quando Aristóteles escrevia sobre processos psicológicos de ânima, Hã? Quando ele vai falar sobre a axiologia, sobre ética, ética anicômico. Você está entendendo? Então, no seu querido amigo Wolf, acontece a mesma coisa. É, e as pessoas da psicologia têm uma enorme dificuldade de juntar essas duas partes. Não é? E aí, ontem eu falava sobre Brentano e me dei conta de uma palavrinha que, gente, essa palavra era a palavra que eu precisava, agora, em, em trabalhos recentes, eu não lembrava. É, 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 como é que era? Psicognose, é, é psico, 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 uma coisa desse tipo assim, justamente para mostrar a diferença entre processo e moral, que, no fundo, é a grande questão. E o que ele está fazendo dessa sua sequência que você apontou aí é a leitura ontológica. E essa mesma leitura está num, 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 num escritor chamado Wilber, que, que tem um quadro antológico que vai dar em Deus igual, e no Henriques, que escreve sobre a unidade da psicologia. Então, eu acho que vocês pegaram uma coisa muito boa com essa diferença aí que começa com esse, é, a, a, o externo e o interno. Não é? Muito obrigado, professor Arthur. É, a pergunta, então, é um comentário ou uma pergunta para o senhor? Comentário. Então, tá bom. É, alguém mais? Agora, vamos para o Well, I thank you very much both the, the talking. Um, I think about uh, Fechner. I read uh, a lot uh, years ago. Um, a text, a paper that says the title was uh, Foucault is in, Fechner is out. Uh, the way how you, we can teach Foucault, Foucault now, nowadays, but you can, Foucault is in, Fechner is out. So we can not teach today Fechner. Fechner is an old thing. And that's why I thank you the way you try Fechner to nowadays. But uh, I think uh, if you uh, have to, can explain a little more about the readings of uh, the reception of Fechner, I think about uh, S.S. Stevens and his way of understanding Fechner. And he has, a, I think he had a philosophical project, a political project also. And this is a kind of reading he had about Fechner. That's it. Uh, thank thank yeah. you for that question. Oh. Yes, I have mine also. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, first, a, a short comment. It's strange, but Foucault quote Fechner in uh, Vigilance and Punishment. Uh, there is a short uh, reference to Fechner there. But my question is very different from that. Uh, I, in 1836, I imagine, uh, Fechner wrote, before his crisis, a book, the, uh, short book about life after death. After, after death. Yeah. I think this book is very different from, uh, in comparison with the others. What you can comment about this strange and short <coughs> uh, book? The, and I think uh, you can go with these three questions. Um, <laughs> I sh I'm, I'm uh, uh, embarrassed, so I wanted Salo to answer it. But I don't know this book very well. But what I remember in reading about it is that he was already thinking about this concept of spirit. You know, Geist 
in German is the same word for mind. And so it's often difficult when you, when they talk about mental things, they talk about geistige things, literally ghostly things, spiritual things. So he was, I think, in this book under the, under the pen of Dr. Mises taking a very um, bold stance about, um, about thing, spirits never dying. So it, it's a beginning. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about this is that Fechner, although a pastor's son, and so was Wundt, and so was just about everybody uh, who became a scientist in Germany, I think, was a pastor's son or a rabbi's son, um, they, uh, he didn't care a fig about organized religion, really. I mean, he respected it, but he... It wasn't what he was talking about. This was not the God. It was really the best parts of Christianity, Judaism, and other religions, but also the same as the Zoroastrian God of good. And when I looked up Zindavista, I found this interesting uh, thing from Persia where it shows the the, well, we'll call him the scientist down here, the Magi. And there are two gods, the god of evil and the god of good. And this is the enlightenment where all of a sudden uh, the stimulus is enough to give consciousness of knowledge to the Magi. That's the way Fechner thought. This consciousness, God consciousness, never goes away. So... You might as well believe in life after death. Why not? Uh, about, about, I have to think about Foucault being in and Fechner being out. I'm still worried about that one. Maybe Salo has ideas. <laughs> but on the other thing you talked about, Stevens, one important point I want to make is that in um, English-speaking world, probably European-speaking world, there was a great authority of Edwin G. Boring in thinking about the founders of psychology. And Edwin G. Boring, when he began to write his history of experimental psychology, had just brought Smitty Stevens to Harvard and loved his laboratory. And if you read carefully in uh, history of European or his, history of experimental psychology, Boring says, well, you know, Wundt was the founder of psychology, but, you know, really, if you ask me to be honest, I say Fechner was, because he quantified and organized experiments before Wundt did, but he didn't realize that he was doing psychology. In fact, for Fechner, psychology was this strange things like aesthetics that philosophers did. And so Wundt, you know, was not quite that. He found a way to make it work institutionally, and Fechner didn't. He was outside the institution. He was thinking about higher things. So uh, the uh, role of Stevens in our historiography, in our understanding of whether Fechner is in, you know, Boring put him in big time. And uh, to some extent, the argument is still pretty good, I think. É, vou tentar responder rapidamente, é, William, começando pelo seu comentário. Eu acho que a dificuldade de trazer a estética e a questão do, da, da esfera axiológica para a psicologia está presente claramente na psicologia contemporânea. E, para o Fechner, essa distinção não existia. Ele achava que tudo tinha que entrar no projeto. Né? É, Patrícia, obrigado pelo seu comentário. Eu acho que o fato do Foucault estar em New Fashion estar alto diz muito sobre o estado da nossa própria cultura contemporânea. Eu acho que já é um sintoma da nossa cultura. É, agora, como ensinar Fechner hoje? Eu tenho não só pensado isso com os meus alunos, mas eu tenho feito... É muita, muitos exercícios de reflexão sobre isso. A maior dificuldade que eu vejo é exatamente essa. Como o David falou, 
O Fechner nunca separou a ciência de metafísica, religião. Para ele era tudo uma coisa só. Então, é, esse não é mais o nosso background intelectual. A nossa cultura contemporânea não tem espaço mais para Deus, para a dimensão de Deus, por exemplo. Então, para o aluno de 18, 19 anos de idade que chega na universidade para entender esse contexto intelectual do século XIX, é muito difícil, porque não é mais o dele. Então, aquilo que era óbvio para o século XIX alemão, não é mais óbvio para nós. E isso cria uma enorme dificuldade de você ensinar, em pouco tempo, um pensamento complexo e profundo dessa natureza. Além disso, tem a parte da matemática, Entender o projeto da psicofísica sem entender pelo menos um pouco de logaritmo, de relação logarítmica, que é a base matemática do projeto do Fechner, torna o projeto quase incompreensível. Então, você vai somando essas dificuldades, você ensinar o Fechner hoje, em 2019, é quase como se fosse um extraterrestre caído aqui na nossa cultura pós-moderna. Então, você cria esse estranhamento nós não estamos falando da mesma coisa mais. Então, por isso que ler Foucault é muito mais tranquilo, porque o Foucault está falando da nossa cultura, do nosso horizonte. O Fechner, não. O Fechner está falando de coisas que, para nós, nem se colocam mais como problema. Então, isso, para mim, é o, grande, é o grande desafio. E como é que traz isso para uma sala de aula de graduação? É um problemaço. Eu... Não sei como é que resolve, eu só enxergo o problema. Obviamente, Foucault é mais simples, com exceção de palavras e as coisas, que eu não recomendo para ninguém em Sônia. É... Bom, eu acho que a gente, com agora pontuou as 45 minutos de atraso, nós vamos fechando aqui a sessão, mas a gente vai fazer agora um lançamento de livro e um coffee break, só chamando aqui a atenção de alguns detalhes do que o Saulo tava, é, vai estar ali presente, autografando, ao mesmo tempo, é, autor, caixa, fazendo tudo ao mesmo tempo, assim como é próprio da nossa profissão aqui. Mas é, o que o Saulo está lançando é uma parte de uma coleção mais ampla, que começa com Wundt, que é um autor que ele tem muito... Eu já é conhecido desde, desde muito tempo esse domínio que o Saulo tem sobre os textos do Wundt, né, é, resgatando alguns do fundo da biblioteca, das bibliotecas, mas ele agora traz aqui esse livro que tem, esse pequeno livro que tem a tradução de três textos, dois textos com os comentários dele. Então, de uma certa maneira, quem diz, pergunta se ele é autor, ele, de uma certa maneira, pelos pés de página, ele entra livro adentro, mas a ideia, como o Saulo já falou antes, é que isso redunde numa coleção com outros é, ditos clássicos passando por é, George Mead, é, William James, John Watson, John Dewey e outros tantos, Jean Piaget e outros tantos. Todos, você é que vai fazer o um lançamento de livro, amigo. Só, é só para situar, essa, essa ideia da coleção ela surgiu há dez anos atrás, só que é muito difícil no Brasil você encontrar uma editora que é, dê apoio para um projeto dessa natureza, é um projeto muito pesado. Então, eu fiz um projeto de 30 anos, e só agora, em 2015, que eu consegui o apoio de uma editora é, de, de peso, que é a editora Rogreff, em São Paulo, que é especializada em psicologia. Então, a ideia é trazer, pensando principalmente nos nossos estudantes, trazer os textos clássicos dos principais psicólogos que fundaram a tradição psicológica, que nunca foram traduzidos em português. Então, trazer esses textos pela primeira vez traduzidos direto do original, por autores que conhecem a língua original, conhecem o autor, com comentários, com notas de rodapé para facilitar a compreensão do, do, do texto. Eu estou muito feliz porque, claro, fui eu que tive a ideia, mas eu estou feliz pelo, pelo o impacto que eu acho que isso possa ter para nós, da área de história, principalmente no ensino de história da psicologia no Brasil, que todo mundo reclama sempre, e com razão, de que não tem texto para trabalhar em sala de aula, porque os textos estão em alemão, estão em latim, 
estão em francês, estão em russo, estão em italiano. Então, a ideia da coleção é acabar um pouco com esse obstáculo e, pelo menos, alguns textos, não, claro, obras inteiras, mas textos fundamentais dessa tradição que ficam fora da possibilidade dos nossos estudantes terem acesso por causa das línguas originais. Então, a ideia é simples e eu espero que, a longo prazo, que isso produza um impacto positivo no Brasil para os nossos estudantes. A coleção é pensada para estudantes. Tá? Obrigado.